again, everyone. It's good to be back with the VHS reviews. But, of course, I'm not alone. With me is my good friend, Sir Duke95. Well, hey, everyone. It's Sir Duke95. I know it's been a minute. Uh, I've been pretty busy, but I'm super happy to get back to work and reviewing Thomas Media. This release is kind of something Tay and I have had in the works for a while. For almost two years, we've talked about it, but we've put other releases back up in the schedule before this, and we just decided to finally review it now because we had talked about it for so long. So because we still have a few days left of summer, we both thought... Why not a release that has sort of a summary kind of feel to it? And we chose Make Someone Happy. Bet you guys weren't expecting this, now were you? So without any further delay, let's take a look at the release history. Make Someone Happy and Other Thomas Adventures was released on VHS on July 25th, 2000 by Anchor Bay. This release had a very interesting tape production. What I mean is, not only did this VHS have the typical blue and black ink labels, but it also had white and black sticker labels in the same style as the inks. And I know that these labels are very uncommon. It wasn't until sometime in 2004, Make Someone Happy was re-released on VHS with another equally rare label. However, two years in between, came the first DVD release, which came out on March 5th, 2002, once again by Anchor Bay. Exactly two years later, the DVD was released again by Anchor Bay Hit Entertainment. A slim case was released sometime in 2005 and went on a four-year hiatus until Lionsgate re-released the DVD once more sometime in 2009. And the final DVD release was then retitled to Really Useful Engines, along with many other classic Thomas releases. I still do not like the look of these covers. They really are very bland in comparison to the originals. And let's not forget, there are many other ways to find Make Someone Happy, including two different releases of the Totally Thomas Volume 1 set, Ertl and Wooden Railway Bonus Packs, and even a limited edition tin box thing. Don't ask me what that is, because I have no idea. And with that, that completes the history portion. Now let's talk about the episodes. So Make Someone Happy contains six whimsical stories from season five, all once again told by Alec Baldwin, and at the end features a bonus song. Our story stops are Make Someone Happy, A Big Surprise for Percy, Happy Ever After, Thomas and the Rumors, James and the Trouble with Trees, and Ba. So we're going to begin with our title-centered episode, Make Someone Happy. Mrs. Kindly is upset after she's told her sister can't come to stay with her. So SDH arranges some special rides from Harold, giving her a tour of the island, and James, who takes her to the fairground later that evening. Already, we're starting off with what I think is a very overlooked episode. When I say overlooked, I mean, how many people actually talk about this episode compared to the other more exciting ones from season five? I've personally not seen very many, but this episode has a wonderful message about spreading happiness to those in need. And who better to test that on than Mrs. Kindly herself? Now, some may argue, What's so special about Mrs. Kindly that the whole island has to stop what they're doing and tend to her to make her happy? But that's kind of the whole point here. Yeah, she is a minor character, but even the most minor of characters deserve to be happy, right? And that's why this message is so powerful for this particular story. Not for nothing, but this was a very important message for James, as we all know how stuck up he can really be. Only afterwards does he realize, when you go out of your way to cheer someone up, it can make you feel really good. Even though that doesn't exist for CGI James, but we don't talk about that. Another thing that I found really cool about this episode, and feel free to call me slow if you wish, but the fairground music? Yeah, truth be told, I never knew that that was the Thomas theme, done up completely different to sound like fairground music. Once again, Mike and Junior, 
at their best. That's a very clever rendition for the Thomas theme. And is anybody going to talk about how good Alec Baldwin's voice is for Mrs. Kindly? I know it sounds really goofy for a male to do a woman's voice, but somehow it actually works. What's the matter, asked James Driver. My sister is rung to tell me she can't come to stay with me. I was so looking forward to her visit. Oh, she cried, you've brought me to the fairground. How lovely. Overall, this episode definitely needs some more appreciation, more so for its powerful moral. It may be one of the more laid back episodes, but it's a damn good one in my book. I'm ranking it a nine out of 10. What are your thoughts, Matt? So I'd imagine a lot of you aren't familiar with this, but Britt Allcroft is actually a huge Frank Sinatra fan. And it's no surprise then that the title for this episode comes from a song by another famous crooner, Make Someone Happy by Jimmy Durante. The lyrics from the song actually reflect the plot of the Thomas episode. It's so important to make someone happy. Make just one someone happy. Pretty neat little tidbit, huh? Like, definitely that's not a coincidence. With that being said, I feel this episode is unfairly overlooked by fans. When comparing it to the rest of season five, in my opinion, this episode has one of the best messages presented in the entire show. It's the importance of spreading happiness and joy to those around you when they need it. It's a motto I try to live my life by for better or worse, and that's a direct result of this episode. And yes, I know fans have argued that it's kind of ridiculous and unrealistic that the whole island would stop to cheer some relatively minor old lady character up, but I think that's kind of the point. Choosing someone minor like Mrs. Kindly to be a person cheered up by the engines is meant to show that we should show all people kindness and spread kindness and happiness to everybody when we can, even if it's someone we barely know. That's the reason for us to live and breathe as people. And it's a really powerful message. Is it unrealistic? Yes, but the message is the point, not the realism. And I wish more people saw that. All in all, it's not perfect, but this is definitely one of my personal favorites from season five. And it features Thomas at its most uplifting and cheerful. I'd give it an eight out of 10. Just one question I have from the previous watch through though, that I never noticed before. Who the f is Harry Topper? Holy shit. Wait a minute, like, if you rearrange the letters, like, if you, if you drop the P here and add the T... God damn it! Next episode is... A Big Surprise for Percy, or A Surprise for Percy in the UK dub. Okay, that was a really dumb title change. Percy is tired of the same old routine where nothing exciting ever happens on Sodor, but when he deals with some troublesome cars, they break away and soon the chase is on to stop them before they reach the village. Over the years, I've had some pretty fun memories with this one, but nowadays, it seems like this episode really isn't that exciting to be perfectly honest. I do not understand Percy's logic in this story. I get not wanting to be stuck in the same old boring routine, but seriously? Nothing exciting ever happens on Sodor? Percy, what the hell do you think just happened in the last story? What happens episodes from now? Hell, what happens throughout a majority of this season alone? And you are really gonna sit there and complain that nothing absolutely nothing ever happens on Sodor. Oh, shit! And I also don't get the climax. What is the purpose of SDH and Birdie being there during the runaway? First of all, SDH doesn't even do anything when they reach where they need to be. And what, did Birdie just so happen to have the men with him? Because they never mentioned that. They just show up out of nowhere. And what world do we live in where a bus or a car are faster than an engine? I, I can't, I, I just can't. So yeah, not the best Percy-centered story I've seen, but you know something, 
certainly not the worst one either. I'm personally just not a huge fan of this one anymore. I'm ranking this in the middle with a 5 out of 10. What do you think, Matt? This episode is the most mid thing I could think of in my life. It's season 5, so it looks and it sounds great, but the plot is very simple, and in fact, too simple in my opinion. Percy is bored because surprises never happen on the island? What the f*** does he even mean? Like, the show is filled with surprises, and stories about surprises. Hell, the previous episode on this f tape was about a surprise. I just don't get where he's coming from here. And then the chase makes no sense either. Bertie and Topham join in for some reason, and somehow they're able to beat Percy to the trucks that he was chasing, even though Topham has to get in his car, drive down to the tracks, and you know, like, Bertie was, I don't know why Bertie's joining in the, the chase, like, you know, like, yeah, I mean, he's a bus. They're not really known for moving quickly, and, but somehow they're able to beat Percy by, like, a good amount of time, even though Percy immediately was following them. That's just Stupid, like what the temper temper. All jokes aside, however, this episode isn't awful, but it's so by the numbers and truly forgettable. If you watch the rest of the season and left this episode out, you wouldn't be missing anything. I'd give this episode a very, very mediocre and average five out of ten. And our next story is. Happy Ever After. Mrs. Kindly asks Percy to help her put together a good luck package for her daughter's wedding. Percy then travels all over Sodor looking for something old, new, borrowed, and blue in time for the ceremony and is even asked to be Mrs. Kindly's special guest. Now we're getting into a really good Percy story. When it comes to original stories, this is one of the best. You won't find a more wholesome episode than this one. Everything just kind of flowed nicely for the build-up at the end for the wedding. I even love it how it was Percy who had to be the one to find the things for the good luck package and leave it to him to be super creative. Also, am I the only one that laughs when Mrs. Kindly's daughter kisses Percy? It never fails to get a chuckle out of me. You know, it's the little moments like these where I really appreciate some of the laid-back stories. You honestly don't need to have a crash or something over the top just to make the story good. Sometimes, all you need are cute moments just like this one. And Mike and Junior also do a bang-up job with the music. I love how they take an actual wedding theme and weave it into a Thomas style. These two. They're freaking geniuses! So, yeah, in my book, best episode on this tape. I just can't find anything wrong to complain about with this episode, because what is there to complain about, you know? I can't help but rank this episode a 10 out of 10. What are your thoughts, Matt? As much as I like Make Someone Happy, Happy Ever After is definitely the best episode on this tape. It's got such a sweet story and everything pays off really well. Like Thomas being the something blue for the good luck package. I just absolutely adore it. Mike and Junior also do a knockout job in this episode, weaving classical wedding themes into the score for this episode. <laughs> I'd argue that out of all of Thomas's episodes across the history of the classic series, this is probably the most upbeat story of the bunch, and one of the best original stories in the series. The Good Luck Package story has always stuck with me, even since I was the kid. And I'd really recommend it for anybody getting into the show or anybody that is a fan of the show. To be honest, like, I don't really have much more to say about it, except I'd give it a nine out of 10. It's just delightful. Up next we have Thomas and the Rumors. The children's playground is closed down, and as Thomas tries to figure out how to help, the other engines are too busy focusing on a questionable visitor. Everyone assumes because he is using Harold that they will all be replaced. Oh, look at that. Another one I don't care about. God, where do I start with this one? 
We start off with this plot line about the children's playground, but then the plot sort of shifts to everybody worried about this visitor. And one rumor just leads to another when everyone thinks Harold wants to replace them all. The playground plot isn't even a thought again till the very end. And it's not like we get to see the finished product. And why look for a new location? This playground would be located close to a school, no? Given this line? Teacher says the sand is soiled and too dirty to play in. So if the sand was too dirty for them to play in, then why not just replace the sand? So on that note, what exactly did Thomas do to help out the situation? Nothing that I can really think of. And that's only half of the story. The other half just feels like filler, and the engines act pretty dumb throughout this particular part. Now, I see what they were trying to go for. That being, it's always of significance to have all your facts straight before you jump to any kind of conclusion. I get it. But you know something? All of this could have been avoided had SDH maybe said something, since he knew about the visitor way ahead of time. And also, how do we know Percy didn't mix up what he heard? Wouldn't SDH have told his driver what was going on and maybe have said something to Percy to tell the rest of the bunch? Ugh, the more I actually deep think this, my brain continuously hurts and the more confusing this episode becomes. So I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead and I'm gonna rank this episode a 2 out of 10. That is for Alex's enthusiasm once again and the crash to me is funny because it at least happened to Gordon for being stupid. Nothing more. What's your take on this, Matt? Thomas and the Rumors is terrible. And I, when I mean terrible, I mean terrible. Like, it is so bad. It is one of the worst written episodes of the classic series. And that makes it a frustrating rewatch anytime I put it on. And usually, I don't. As a friend of mine once said to me, how is a train going to help you reopen your playground? What's he going to do? Dig out the sand? I mean, I know kids could be naive, but why didn't these kids think to ask their teacher first? At least something with hands and thumbs, like Jesus Christ. Oh, I think I can answer that. These children couldn't wait to get their precious little playground all fixed up so they could go and play with our toys in the sand. Go and play with our toys in the sand. The engines are also really stupid in this episode, too. All of their escapades with Harold feel like such filler. And even at the end when they find the sand, we never see the playground. And that's something that's always bothered me, even since I was a kid. And, and the thing about it, too, like, this, they're like, oh, let's use the sand from a dirty construction site for your new sandbox, children. It's just so dumb. But the biggest problem with this episode for me is that Gordon's driver lets him race Harold and, and gets in on the action with him. How would he not know any better? It's just an excuse for the story. If it were real life, the man would lose his job. Who would do that? Plus, why would they need to look for a new spot for a playground? Even if the old site is unusable, why fly over the entire island? Like, wouldn't you want to build it near the old playground? I don't know, folks. The more you look at this episode, the more of a confusing mess you find. It may be from season five, but that doesn't keep it from being terrible. I give it a very, very definitive two out of 10. The next episode is James and the Trouble with Trees. After James gets a new coat of paint, the other engines are busy removing trees that have grown too close to the line. James quickly ignores their warnings that trees can be just as powerful as engines, but he soon questions how much he bargained for when a tree slides onto the rails, nearly causing an accident. Here is another good pickup from the last one. This is another one of those instances where James thinks he can outdo anything and this time he feels like he can beat trees of all things while it's silly for him to think such things it's an important lesson to learn that nobody can beat mother nature with whatever she dishes out that's just a fact of life and the fact that james had to be the one to go through this particular scenario are any of us even shocked at this point but then again this is james we are talking about the one thing I really liked about this was how Thomas had a perfect opportunity to take any jab at James, but chose not to. 
he understood the severity of the situation and knew that his friend's safety was far more important. That's one of the reasons why I love Thomas in this season. It really shows you how much Thomas has matured as a character throughout each individual season. But as for music, it's nothing to completely rave about, although I do appreciate the tense music kick in as James nearly runs into the tree. Oh, and uh, thanks again for the nightmares, James. Really appreciate it, bro. Again, are any of you shocked that another season five moment scared me as a child? Yeah, 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 Tay was a big chicken, moving on. I won't go out of my way to say that this is one of my all-time favorite James stories, but it is one of his spotlight episodes that I do thoroughly enjoy. I'm giving this a solid 8 out of 10. What do you think about this episode, Matt? To be honest, James and the Trouble with Trees is fun, and it had the potential to be a truly great episode, but it misses the landing at the ending just enough to make it only good at best. But why is that? Well, on re-watching it last time, I realized that it honestly features Baldwin's sassy gay James at his absolute funniest and best. From the trucks insulting James's appearance, to James getting dressed up for this upcoming drag performance. Well, hi there. I'm the delicious Miss Mandarin. <gasps> mm. That was good. The episode has some really realistic storm effects and lighting, but also some very frightening moments. It's really exciting, honestly. But why is it only good? What keeps it from being great? Well, I finally pinpointed that to two things on my last watch through. Firstly, the tree. It looks stunning, but when the tree actually falls, it just kind of bounces off the ground and it starts to feel really fake after that. Not to mention the sound effect they use for it doesn't really fit the visual at all. They were just in time. In my opinion, this kind of cheapens the suspense of the episode. Is this a nitpick? I'm honestly not so sure. Picture the Titanic movie, for example. The iceberg is built up throughout the course of that film, but imagine what it would feel like if the ship just bounced off the side of some rubber iceberg crop. It would feel just as silly. Now, I know the Titanic movie had a much bigger budget, but come on, surely they could have gotten something a little bit more realistic than that. The second thing that keeps this episode from being a slam dunk is the ending. Once Thomas saves James from the tree, you could tell the writers really struggled to find out how to end the episode. So they rush Edward in with some really clunky exposition to give it a definite ending note. But not only is it forgettable, but it seems really forced and rushed too. Just then, Edward bustled in. <laughs> Sir Topham Hat thinks you're both brave engines. Thomas, you're going to have a new coat of paint. And James, Sir Topham Hatt says that tomorrow you'll pull the Special Express. Everyone was very happy. All that being said, James and the Trouble with Trees is still a very entertaining episode. While it definitely has its flaws, it's still a fun ride overall. All in all, I'd give it a 7 out of 10. And now our last episode is Ba. So Topham holds a contest for the best dressed station, and while everyone is getting ready, Percy has some trouble with what seems to be a bothersome ram, only to find out that this animal is very useful after trapping some boys for ruining the station. Um, what? Yeah, plain and simple, I really don't like this episode. I was never fond of it, even as a kid. The story, for one, is kind of messy. I get the whole best dress station thing, but when we shift to this ram who looks like a bother, but then the story shifts again to the station trashed, and then we find out three little <laughs> destroyed it because they thought it was fun? I'm sorry, is anybody else here confused? What also bothers me about this story is, what exactly is the moral here? Because I can't find one and there's certainly no character development within this plotline, and the main focus is on Percy. But what does he learn from all of this? Not a damn thing, which makes this story even less interesting. Actually, the more I look into this, I feel like this was a cheesy way to do the whole don't judge a book by its cover thing. And what I mean by that is, Everyone was quick to believe that the Ram was the culprit for everything that happened, 
until they discovered the boys. Not gonna lie, but that sounds very cheap compared to the other stories that have tackled this topic much better. Um, hello? I guess I really don't have anything else to say about this, so I'm gonna give this episode a 3 out of 10. And only for some of the pretty looking visuals, Percy's Season 5 theme rendition is also nice to listen to, and I'm giving props to Alec again for the enthusiasm. Other than that, I don't give a ram about this episode. And yes, I just made that joke. Deal with it. <sighs> anyway, what do you think about this episode, Matt? I know that some people love this episode, and while I agree it has some cute moments, I feel that overall Ba is just really convoluted. So much of the dialogue in this episode makes no sense within the world of the story. For example, Percy's driver tells him, when he's backing down on the flower train, what the train exactly is. Next morning, Percy was proud to be sparkling again. His train of freight cars were being loaded with vegetables and flowers. These are for Maithwaite, said his driver. They'll display them on the platform. To provide exposition, it makes sense, but within the confines of the universe set up by the story, it doesn't. Why would he only tell Percy what the train was right before he pulled it? It doesn't make any sense. This episode is littered with exposition and heavy dialogue scenes that do not pay off. They set up Percy being smelly and fishy in the beginning, only to never have that story beat come back into play. For me, it's a really dull episode filled with very forced exposition and story beats. Although, I do have to admit, I like these scenes. My favorite station is Fafarquhar, said Thomas. Mine is Maithwaite, said Toby. Percy, what's yours? Percy was too tired to think properly. The docks. The wind from his blades blew Sir Topham Hatt's hat off. Well, seems I wouldn't be able to eat my hat even if I had to. Other than that, this episode is just forgettable and bland to me. I give it a very mediocre 4.5 out of 10. And to close everything off, we have our bonus song. It's great to be an engine. Well, since my classic song rankings, has my opinion changed at all? Eh, kinda not really. It's still kind of a mid song for me. I guess the only thing I didn't really elaborate on last time was that I liked the visual interpretation of the lyrics, thinking how wonderful it must be to be an engine working on Sodor. Cause like I mentioned last time, this and the island song was what had me thinking Sodor was a real place, and how I wanted to be an engine like Thomas and the others. I realize now it's songs like this that really help a child's imagination flow. Now, it's still catchy, don't get me wrong, but if someone asks me to think of any season five song, this is not one of the first ones that comes to mind, as I personally feel like there are slightly better ones compared to this one. What do you think, Matt? Let's get into a song that I'm not huge on, but a song that I think is worth talking about. It's great to be an engine. As much as I love a lot of their songs for Thomas, this one is probably one of my least favorites. Is it a bad song? No, not at all. But compared to some of their other songs for Thomas, this one sounds a bit too bright and tinny sounding. Now, I have to clarify, the term bright in this context, I'm using from my musical background. If you're a musician, then you may have been told at one point in your career to focus on creating a darker sound and a more rich tone, which is the ideal for a musician. A darker sound feels warm and balanced. Here's an example. Now, compare that to this. Oh, yes, it's great to be an engine as you're steaming along. Pump, pump, pumping along. Beep, beep, beeping along. Feel the wind around you as you push along. Pump, pump, pumping along all day. See what I mean about a bright sound versus a dark sound? It's not just the kids. It's the orchestration and arrangement, too. 
Both the orchestration and the performance by the chorus make it feel really high-pitched, shrill, and tinny sounding, aka bright and cold. The children's chorus is just naturally gonna sound bright. They can't help it, they're kids. And they sing in a much higher vocal range without having as much experience as adult vocalists, or the balance of having some lower pitched adult voices in there. Mike and Junior have made these kids' voices work in other songs for Thomas, but it just doesn't work for me here. It's just a bit too shrill and it lacks the balance of their other songs. I know this is getting into the real nitty gritty of music, but it's something I just can't ignore. The tune is also a bit too sing-songy and the lyrics are a little grating to me. I do like this part, however. When you light the fire and stoke the fire and we'll be there for you. All of this aside though, I think what really kills the song for me is the really saccharine bridge in the middle. Just think how wonderful it would be to live on the magical island of Sodor, helping Thomas the Tank Engine and his friends all day long. It would be like a dream come true. I know it's supposed to be sweet and cute, but for me, it's just a bit too corny. Like, why is this in this song? All in all, it's a fun song for kids, I suppose. And as I said, it's not a bad song, but for me, and as I'd imagine a number of other adults, this is that Thomas track to hit the skip button on. So, what do the both of us think of Make Someone Happy? Matt, what are your thoughts? Given all that I've said in this review about these episodes, I bet y'all can infer how I feel about the necessity of owning this tape. To be honest, as much as I have nostalgia for it, Make Someone Happy is probably the first tape in this entire review series that Tay has done that is absolutely, positively not necessary for your collection. It's got a couple episodes that are winners, but to be honest, even those episodes I would say you really don't need to buy the tape for it. The majority of the tape is pretty mediocre and forgettable. Like, I, I mean, I know there are people that like some of the episodes that I didn't like, but to be honest, this isn't a real winner as far as an overall compilation of episodes. Are there episodes on this tape that I like? Yes, of course there are. I've mentioned the ones that I like. But overall, it's just very flat. And, and it's not really worth your time unless you are really invested in collecting Thomas Media. If there's a season five release that you should skip, this is the one to skip. Aside from the one with Gordon of the Gremlins, but that's another story. Yeah, it's decent, but given that it was from series five, I really think they just shifted all of the weaker episodes from that series onto this tape with a couple better ones, like Make Someone Happy and Happy Ever After are good and Trouble with Trees is pretty okay. But the other ones are just kind of the bottom of the barrel of that season. To be honest, I think they intentionally just shifted over the weaker episodes from Series 5 onto this tape because they knew they weren't as big of smashes as the ones on Cranky Bugs, Racist Rescues and Runaways, and Spills and Chills. Those are great tapes, absolutely great. But this one, it's just really flat. If you like feel-good stuff, and if you absolutely adore Thomas, and you love collecting the media, buy this tape for your collection. Or if you're nostalgic for it, buy it for your collection. But if you don't really have any attachment to any of these episodes, or you're not a really huge Thomas Media collector, this is the very first tape in Tay's series that I think you could skip easily and not be missing a thing. All right, well, I'm very neutral with this tape. Given my personal rankings, I think it's half good and half mediocre, which then leads me to say out of all the season five releases, I think this one is the weakest, but I mean that in a nice way. It's not bad by any means. It's just an okay release at best. Normally, people don't really show interest in this one because this has most of the laid back stories of season five. And again, that is not a bad thing. But I think it's become a little too obvious that if anyone was to pick a favorite release from this season, most would either pick Cranky Bugs, Spills and Chills, or Races, Rescues, and Runaways, because those all at least have some of the more exciting episodes. Whereas on this tape, there are stories on here that I like that others might not, and the same could be said if I don't like certain ones, and others do. So honestly, I feel like this tape is 
a bit controversial, give or take however you feel about these particular episodes. I will say, if you're going for a complete collection, then you kinda have to have this one for completion's sake, but overall, you're not really missing that much. It's just a slap in the middle, 50-50 release. And that, my friends, wraps up this review. Just want to say thanks again for Matt for joining me, and I hope you all enjoyed. I have enjoyed reviewing this. It's not as strong as I wish it was, and I remember it being from my childhood, but I mean, it's, it's still okay. It's still decent. And I have enjoyed reviewing this, and I'm glad that you let me be a part of your series, Tay. Thank you again for inviting me to be a guest on your show. And I can't wait to join you all again. Boy, do we have some plans for you in the future. Just you wait, everybody. If you liked this video, then don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more of these and other Thomas-related content. Also, don't forget to check out all my other reviews in my playlist down in the description. So, what is my next review going to be? Well, I think it's time we tackle another of my favorite Season 3 releases. And I've been putting this one off for far too long. And believe me when I say... I think we can all trust it'll definitely be a good one. Thank you all again, and I will see you in the next video.